Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Cyborg Conspiracy, and that will be released on May 15th of 2020. So get excited. It's available for pre-order right now. If you're new to Banneker Bones, uh, number one, how many episodes of the show have you listened to? Because I talk about it every show. What are you doing with your life, esteemed audience? But that's okay. I welcome you now. Head to uh, any fine place that books are sold. You can check out the first book, Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. You can get that as a audiobook i know you like to listen to things you can get it as a paperback and the ebook is free free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this wherever fine ebooks are sold uh if you love the middle grade ninja podcast but you prefer to read adult horror i've got you covered under the super secret pen name robert kent i've written the young adult novel all together now a zombie story three guesses what that one's about uh, and a serial horror novel, The Book of David, uh, about an atheist that purchases a haunted house that then begins to give him religious visions involving flying saucers. It is nuts. It's written in the style of Stephen King, and it's five volumes long. If you're curious, if you just want to dip your toe in, you can download the ebook for The Book of David, Chapter 1 by Robert Kent for free. You get that one for free. And once you're hooked on the story, come see me with money for chapters two, three, four, and five. Uh, you're going to have a great time. You can also get the whole thing as a compilation. That's it for the advertisements. As always, head to middlegradeninja.com. Catch up with uh, more than a decade now of hundreds of interviews of agents, authors, editors, publishing professionals, folks you'd be interested in. Plus, I keep a schedule of who is coming up on the show and when episodes will air. So head to Middle Grade Ninja. You can enjoy all of that and enough my god let's talk to our guest kayla Knoll. kayla how are you today i'm doing very well how are you i am good i feel like i nailed the intro so now i can relax yes. <laughs> we're in good shape um yes. the best place to start is uh never me trying to summarize your biography because i'll make a mess of it um so if you would just go ahead and tell esteemed audience a little bit about yourself and an overview of your career thus far Sure. So uh, I'm a middle grade author, as you know, and I was born in San Francisco in 1987. Uh, I was actually, I was born in a kind of countercultural family on an ashram. My mother followed a guru and um, I had a fairly unusual childhood. And then we moved back to uh, New Jersey, which is where my mom is from when I was in kindergarten. And I grew up in New Jersey. We moved all over the state. So for anyone else out there from New Jersey, I, we probably have some places in common. Um, then I, uh, in, instead of going to regular high school, I did independent study. I was technically homeschooled, and I spent a lot of time in the library, and I got my GED when I was 16. And I went back to the Bay Area for a year, and I went to a small college in Oakland called Mills, um, which is a very at least back then, about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, it was very, um, a little bit run down and mysterious. And I'd always been a writer and always been working on books. But when I was at Mills, I feel like that was the period of my life when I really started um, seriously working on novels. Um, then I transferred to NYU and I lived at home. Uh, my mom lived in Jersey City throughout my teenage years and my 20s. So I commuted to, to NYU. And I graduated from there and I worked for a literary agent and elsewhere in publishing. Um, I met and married my husband, Travis Smalley, who's an artist and a teacher. He teaches at uh, RISD in Rhode Island. And um, I worked at a digital arts nonprofit within the New Museum in New York, where I was a program coordinator and then I was a managing editor for it's online, um, kept this online journal of arts writing. So I did a lot of proofreading and editing, and copy editing for that. And for its print. None of which has come in handy at all for your career as an author, right? Pardon? <laughs> we, but none of which has come in handy for your which, career well, as an author, right? It's, it's interesting <laughs> because I feel like one thing I did learn by doing a lot of editing of other people's work that didn't have anything to do with fiction. It was all nonfiction, a lot of theoretical writing or um, and writing of catalog essays for exhibitions. It did teach me a lot about uh, humility or maybe it goes both directions where I had a lot of um, 
empathy for the people I was editing. So I was gentler with them maybe. And then it also came back and I, I know what it's like to be on both sides of this, the, of the word doc. <laughs> You know, so that, or that, that you softened your expectations for when uh, some editor was coming after you later? Yeah, well, Virginia, my, Virginia Duncan, my editor, is very gentle. I mean, she's incredible, but everything is very, um, very subtle. So I, I haven't really had an editor who is extremely tough or abrasive because Virginia is not like that. I mean, I imagine with your experience as an editor and a proofreader, by the time she comes in, there's there's nothing left to do, right? <laughs> no, not at all. She came, so I, the manuscript that uh, was sent out on submission for coup had, I should have looked up how much it was when it went out. I think it was 50,000 words. And Virginia had me through, um, we didn't we didn't make any structural changes or she didn't suggest any structural changes to coup. But she suggested a lot of, in her line edits, um, uh, adding description to scenes and adding dialogue. And it ended up being another 10,000 words. So she had me actually expand the book, but within the structure of what already was there. So we did a lot of, a lot of edits. So out of curiosity, just a really nerdy question just right off the bat. Yeah, of uh, what was the final word count or pretty close to the final word count before you published Oh, before, in the, bef, uh, well, what's the, what's the version up? for the arc that I read? <laughs> oh, yeah, 60,800. Okay. So, it's, it's really long, uh, as, um, in page count, but the manuscript that I actually submitted, I think, was 250 pages as a document, and it was 60,800 words. So, they chose, um, oh, they made a lot of design choices that made the book physical form longer, but it has fairly large type and white space. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, something that, that fascinated me, and I'm uh, jumping all over the place, I, I, I know. Uh, but uh, we should absolutely mention that Coup by Kayla Knoll is, is available now, right? Uh, uh, as, as we're talking, March, March uh, 3rd, yeah. I can't remember. Yes, it's available. <laughs> I can't remember if it's about to be available or if it just can't either way. <laughs> the esteemed audience, go March to wherever books Sold. If it's there, buy it. If it's not, pre-order it. Pick it up during the week. You're going to have a good time either way. Yes. yes. Um, so something I wanted to ask you about, we'll just get straight to this question that I'm, I'm never sure um, what's a, what's, I, I always try to frame my questions. And if I were on the show, would I want to be asked this question? And I think I would. Um, because 68,000 words is a little bit longer for middle grade. It's shorter than, I'm sorry, longer than the first Spanaker, but honestly shorter than the second two. Um, so, um, you know, pot, pot to kettle. Uh, but as I read it, because of the way it's formatted, it's like, what, over 400 pages as a paperback. It's just, it's a, when I picked, when I came in the mail, I said, oh my God, I was a little intimidated. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm not even the, uh, necessarily the, in, the intended audience. But then I look at it and there is a lot of white spaces. There are paragraphs uh, in any given page. Most of the paragraphs are under three lines or less. And it reads very fast, which then gave me this feeling of accomplishment as I'm going. I look at this big book that I'm reading so so quickly. They're all through illustrations in the final, final version. So and by Celia Crampion, who's fantastic. So that also takes up space. Do you know? Because so when I when I encountered it, I thought, well, okay, there are some readers that um, you know maybe third, fourth grade will come along and will say, whoa, that's that's a little bit challenging for me. And then there'll be other readers that come along and like, I could do this. I can I can do it. And they're going to feel extra proud of themselves, even though realistically, 68,000 words, um, they've read that's all the Harry, I think all the Harry Potters are longer than that. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually, that 60, so it's, it's you know? actually 60,800. So oh, almost 61,000. Yeah, the first Harry Potter is 75,000. I remember having that in mind when I was doing edits for a kind of sense of rhythm or length. So in the original version, before you got anybody involved, you said it was about 50,000? Yeah, 50, 50 to 52, I think it was, somewhere in that range. So um, it was mostly, most of the edition was in description, adding things to dialogue and making certain scenes longer. But yeah, I hope kids feel confident to pick it up I know when I was maybe not in third grade but by fourth or fifth grade I definitely gravitated towards books that appeared to be longer because I liked 
the sense of accomplishment they gave. And I also definitely as a child, and I still have this as an adult, I would feel often a sense of wistfulness when a book I really liked was nearing the end. So I enjoyed longer books because they gave that sense of being immersed in the world for longer. And that was a feeling that I really sought out when I was a child. Oh, I agree. And let's let let's let's be clear. The kids that get intimidated, they weren't serious readers anyway. Oh, yeah. no, I, <laughs> that's really important. Because I was actually I was never I wouldn't say I was a reluctant reader, but I was one of the last kids in um first grade to learn to read. And I was initially labeled like a late reader. And I didn't I didn't catch up significantly until third grade. In third grade they did um gifted and talented testing and I was put into the gifted class which was great we didn't really do any extra reading we mostly did kinds of uh like word games almost or puzzles I remember um I remember being a little disappointed by that because I wanted to be doing reading but prior to that I had been we had tracked reading groups in second grade and first grade and I was always in the group that needed help I was a late reader by those standards. So I definitely empathize with kids who feel like reading is, is a struggle because I remember that feeling. So what would, uh, who is the ideal uh, reader for Koo? Uh, and what would you have thought when you were the, uh, when you were the ideal reader? I think I would have loved it because I loved any book that suggested other worlds and I especially liked ones where um, the fantasy element was more tied to the world that we actually live in rather than a kind of Tolkien-esque uh, fully formed other worlds um, which I also later I love those books as well now but when I was a kid I really liked books that gave you a sense of um, another way of of the world could be from this world um, like my favorite aspect of the Narnia books, which I loved when I was a child, was that it was four children from this world who were able to go into another world. And with Ku, it's not a fantasy in that sense because there's no overt magic, but there's this sense of, well, could a girl live in secret on a roof and with a flock of pigeons? Is that possible? And the kind of imaginative possibilities of that. When I was a child, I... Um, I loved a book that some people know, and, and then I'm always surprised some people have never, at, so few people have heard of it when I ask, that now I'm surprised when people have heard of it. But um, the, the famous singer, Julie Andrews, she actually also wrote middle grade books that were mostly published, I think, in the 70s. And one of them is called Mandy. She wrote it under the name Julie Edwards. And it's about a girl lives in England in an orphanage and she discovers this abandoned cottage that she begins sneaking to and making into her own home and her own world and when I was a child that was my favorite book and I think that sense of having a space that's secret uh, and a place to go that was hugely appealing to me as a kid and Ku sort of turns that around because it's not really a safe haven per se, but it is a world apart. And um, there's, I also really liked survival stories when I was a kid and Ku is sort of a survival story too. I feel like uh, I've under undersold Ku because <laughs> I, oh. I really enjoy this book, esteemed audience. I want you to listen to it. I'm just fascinated um, by the uh, by the layout and the, and the formatting, which is like the least interesting thing you could yeah, talk about. Okay. But I know that a lot of uh, a lot of fellow book nerds listen to this show, which I always want to excite the book nerds. Like I get excited, um, but um, what I want to I want to ask you more about your reading habits as a child. Um, but let's uh, before we we continue talking about Ku, let's give a esteemed audience who hasn't just read it, uh, who just ordered their copy or ran to the store real fast while we're in their, their head to, to make sure they, they get it off the shelf or the library. Get yourself a copy of esteemed yeah, audience. I love libraries too. What, um, would you give a esteemed audience just an overview of what they can expect to read about when they, when they open up Koo? Sure. Koo is a, about a 10 year old girl whose name is Koo, who has lived almost her entire life in secret on a roof um, 
in a city at the edge of a rail yard. And she's lived with a flock of pigeons who have cared for her since she was a child. And uh, one day, her pigeon that she's closest to, his name is Burr, is injured by a hawk. And she is forced to go down to the ground for the first time to uh, make contact with a local woman named Tully who feeds the flock to try to get him help. And uh, meeting Tully changes her life forever because Tully ends up taking her in and she starts to learn what it's like to live as a human in the human world. And at the same time, uh, they discover that there's a serious threat to her flock of pigeons and all the pigeons in the city. And Ku has to work together with Tully and uh, her local new local neighbor friend Aggie and a pigeon veterinarian veterinarian named Nicholas to try to save the pigeons. It is charming. Oh, <laughs> it is <laughs> an utterly lovely experience. A uh, little 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 uh, little sad, but never too sad. Um, yeah, nobody uh, the pigeons survive. I mean, I, maybe that's a spoiler, but I want, I, as a child, I always wanted to know that there wasn't going to be a kind of, I really struggled with books where there was a wipeout of animals where, where animals really suffered. So I would avoid those. Well, are you somebody that uh, reads the last chapter first? You want to know that everything is going to come out mostly okay? When I was a child, I definitely did. I found books that were truly heart-wrenching really difficult to deal with when i was a kid i would get very um i would get very like emotionally affected for for a while after reading them i'm uh i i uh, never read the end first i in fact i hate myself when i accidentally oh, uh yeah. start in the wrong place wait a minute my bookmark was over there oh no i spoiled oh, no. two chapters from now <laughs> yeah um, but uh, I, I sometimes get a little bit uh, antsy if I think that no one's going to die. Like, wait a minute, thematically, somebody has to has to bite it here. <laughs> well, there are, now I'm actually thinking, does anyone? Die? Well, there's a lot of, there's, I don't want to give away too many spoilers. There are harrowing moments. You can give away all the spoilers you want because it's your book. I am terrible about it, so I always make sure that I let you do the actual talking about the book. Like, did you want to reveal there's a character named Tully? Okay, we could talk about Tully. Now. Yeah, I, mean, I think Tully might be in the. Is Tully in the? Uh, well, I guess Tully is not in the uh, the jacket copy, but I don't mind. I feel like Tully is actually when I. It's interesting talking to readers. I know that there are quite a few readers I've spoken to or who have um, written things that I've read. Uh, after reading the book, who tell you is definitely the character that they feel the most um, kinship with, which I think is great. I love her too. She's very sensitive and compassionate. And um, I find it interesting that uh, I spoke to a group of uh, a kids book club, middle grade kids book club that read the an advanced reader copy edition of Ku um, a few months ago. And we Skyped during their meeting and it was interesting the number of them that wanted a sequel so I was shocked I didn't never even occurred to me but um they wanted a sequel that showed just uh Ku's day-to-day life with Tully and Aggie going to school so I felt like that was really really nice to hear and the kids really connected with Tully as well which I I wasn't I was glad to hear about (laughs) well that this must be nothing compared to the nerve-wracking experience of addressing a group of middle grade readers. Uh, yeah, I was. I, they were lovely. They were great. I, there was no nothing. No, they they were really. They asked really good questions too. Was it a classroom worth, or how many are we talking? You no, know, it was about ten, and it was part of a children's bookstore in Minneapolis, Minnesota, called Wild Rumpus, that I've never been to. Um, but sounds incredible because they have uh, their they have children's books and children's different children's and YA book clubs, and they also have uh, a lot of bookstore animals, um, including uh, some bookstore birds and some cats. The cat came to the meeting and was crawling all over everyone's uh, the table. <laughs> That sounds lovely. The The children were all positive. They had yeah, nice they things to say. They asked, they were, I loved, I loved that there is like a book club 
for, I mean, now I've found out that there are actually quite a few book clubs out there for middle grade readers at bookstores across the country. And I just wish that I had had access to something like that when I was a kid. Um, Cause I didn't, there weren't very many other kids at my school when I was in elementary and middle school who uh, were as into reading as I was. I think I would have really enjoyed um, being in a group of other kids who also identified as readers and really sought out books and got to talk about it. Well, you're certainly making up for it uh, here in uh, (laughs) in later life. Yeah. You are, uh, if, if you haven't been surrounded by readers up to this point, you certainly will be going forward. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, well, you know what, let's, uh, if, 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 if you're good, let's just keep talking about Koo for a minute. Sure. Um, we'll, we'll circle back, because I, I do have some other questions for you, um, uh, specifically about your background and about how you came to read. And I also, I, I might follow up about the, the commune. I'm curious about that. Oh, yeah. Um, but let's talk a little bit uh, more about Ku, because uh, I had read that you had first had this idea uh, a little over a decade ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, what, if you don't mind, uh, go ahead and share that story with us. Sure. I was walking down a street in Jersey City, which is where I was living at the time and where I spent my teenage years and also lived during my early 20s. And at that time, the city was in a, Jersey City was in a really great state state flux with a lot of um, buildings coming down and new construction going up. There had been a lot of rezoning of these industrial areas that were right up against the Hudson River. The other side of the river is Manhattan, lower Manhattan. Um, And I spent a lot of time walking around in these areas that were changing quickly. And I saw this old factory with empty windows. And I was looking up and this gigantic flock of pigeons took off from the top. And um, I just had this sudden image of a girl or a child, actually originally for about a day, who was a boy. And then I changed the, I changed it over to a girl. I just had this image of a child up there with the pigeons. And I was wondering what it would be like for them to live with a flock of pigeons. Um, And I went home and I started drafting and I wrote the first chapter. And, and then it took a very long time to finish the book. And then I did many other drafts before I got my agent. And it How went to be uh, talking from idea to, to rough draft then? Idea to rough draft was actually close to five years because I was about 19 when I got the idea and I was in school and I found it really hard to finish a first draft. I was working on other things. I also thought at the time, oh, maybe I want to write literary fiction You know, I was reading, it was, I think when you're in your late teens and early twenties, there's a lot of, a lot of time where you're figuring out your identity. And sometimes you get ideas that you should be doing this or should be doing that. And for me, I think, although I had wanted to write children's books since I was a child, and that was always the wavering, that was always like a kind of unwavering core in me. There were years where I questioned that. And so I would put Ku down to try to work on short stories. Um, I was really lucky while I was at NYU, I was able to take uh, some really excellent creative writing classes, including um, I took uh, a really formative one with the editor and writer Ed Park. Um, And then I later on, I took a class with Zadie Smith, who is extraordinary and both of those experiences led me to think, ah, maybe I should be writing for adults or maybe I should be writing essays, like literary essays, and maybe I should focus on trying <laughs> to do that. And I would how first things- you publish Coup, that could never happen, right? <laughs> no, it's not, it's not, it was also, I, I was, um, when I was in college, I, uh, I had to work. Like I lived at home, but I also had to work. So I didn't have a lot of time and I always had a job. So I always was either, I was a nanny, I worked at a vintage clothing store, I worked in a preschool as their art teacher for a long time, Um, and I usually had two jobs, and I was also going to school, and I was commuting to and from school, so I was on the PATH train all the time. And those years, I was like, I was just literally running all over New York (laughs) and Jersey City, going from class to my jobs, to try to do my reading and my homework. And then I was also trying to write. And I 
I remember feeling a lot of pressure to use my time in a very economical way. And I think that pressure slowed me down in terms of, of uh, finishing coup and figuring out how I wanted to, um, to be a writer. I mean, it probably spent too long trying to figure that out. But um, ultimately I did finish coup and then I did I think I did two more drafts of it before I even sent it out to agents. And I started sending it out to agents maybe around 2013 for the first time. Um, and I got my agent through your website, um, Katie Grimm, because I read uh, an interview you did with her and I really liked what she said. And so I queried her and she wrote back and she said, I'm really interested. And we talked back and forth a few more times. I revised and I resubmitted to her, I think, before she actually signed me. And then I did uh, more revisions with her before we actually went on sub. And again, I, it, um, I was just, it took me a while because I had a lot of other things in life come up. Like I had um, a really difficult pregnancy with my daughter and we moved a few times and I was working full time. So, um, yeah, Ku had a long journey. I also wrote um, big chunks of two other novels at the same time over the years that I was working on Ku, both of which I've put in a drawer. So was I was... Was little grade or was there a literary one in there? There was a literary one in there that I am very happy. I just, I think I got a lot out of trying to make it work, but ultimately it's not a genre that I enjoy spending a lot of time in, including as a reader. I don't really read literary fiction anymore for adults now that I'm not, uh, not in college. I do sometimes, but not like I read middle grade and I read a lot of adult nonfiction. Um, and I, I still try to read classics and books that older books um, rather than literary fiction that's being published right now. I feel like I can't, I'm just not as interested in that as a genre at the moment. Um, but, uh, and the other book that I, that I wrote probably like 200 pages of, but had a lot of issues with plot was a, another middle grade book. But both of those were kind of like training exercises and Ku never felt like a training exercise. I always knew that I would finish it and I always had a gut feeling that it would be published. You were right. Trust you guys. Yeah, I was. It felt it, it's like a good lesson in in figuring out which project feels like that because I always had that feeling with Ku from the beginning, whereas I didn't have it with these other projects that ultimately didn't didn't work out. Uh, and quick point of clarification: sure. although MiddleGradeNinja.com is undoubtedly the finest resource available to writers today, and everyone listening should go and, and, and check it out. Yes. Uh, Middle Grade Ninja didn't find you an agent. Your hard work, your dedication, and your Absolutely. excellent manuscript Absolutely. found you an agent. That's, but I found her through, I remember I read her interview on your site, and I felt like that is, like I just had this feeling, oh yeah, she, I could connect with this person. And when I queried her, I really did. She's immensely helpful. I mean, Katie's editorial vision and ideas for Ku going back to when she first saw it helped it become published. I, she gave it so much of her time and her expertise before we ever went on submission. And she never made me feel rushed, which was extraordinary too. Do you remember how many times you went back and forth with, uh, with Ms. Grimm? Oh my gosh. I never, I don't, I didn't keep track a lot, a lot. And I, rewrote the ending a few times with Katie. And what was it? Uh, and, and Katie Graham, if you're listening, uh, we'll find you another author almost as good as Kayla Knoll. <laughs> um, come on the show. I would love to talk with you. That will be a wonderful conversation. Yes. Um, what was it uh, about uh, Katie Graham as you were evaluating agents that made you feel that, yes, this is the person you should be pursuing. This is someone you could trust uh, with your baby before you had your baby. She just... Her, I feel like she could be an editor herself, which a, which a lot of agents probably could also be editors, but she really has that editorial um, sensibility and patience. And I just felt like I was, uh, I was in good hands. And Virginia is also an extraordinary editor. And she, it was like this perfect 
pairing where Katie helped me really get it into uh, get it into shape, and then Virginia also finessed it and drew out more. But Katie, I think, more so than many agents, she really um, had the patience to work through drafts until we got it as close to perfection as we could. And I never felt pressured to um, to go on submission before it was really felt right. Do you remember ballpark, how long you went back and forth from the time she signed you to submission? It was about two years, if I remember oh, wow. correctly. And that was also because in the middle, I had trouble, um, like I had a really, with my daughter, I had a lot of pregnancy complications. So I couldn't really write during a chunk of that time. I mean, I tried, but I was having a lot of trouble focusing. So we took a break and then that, and then the following year I ended up deciding to change the ending somewhat significantly, not in, not the very ending, but the, there were some characters that I cut and that all took time. And um, happily I'm working on my second book now and I finished that draft already. So I'm spitting up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and do you have that same gut feeling that yes this is absolutely the next yeah, one yeah def- i think so uh and to answer the uh the the tribunal of middle grade readers uh will there indeed be a coup to or a cuckoo or whatever you call it i don't it's definitely not on the agenda at the moment but i'm waiting i'm i sometimes i get a little idea and i write it down but the second book is another standalone you don't wonder uh, about what happens to Ku afterward? Are you pretty I, well resolved in your head that you, you ended things where they should have been? Well, the kind of questions that I was trying to address with Ku as a book, I feel like were pretty neatly summed up in the book itself in terms of how what it's like to be a real outsider to the human world, what it's like, what things with animal communication and... Um, that sense of adjustment or who's unusual perspective on the way that uh, life works right now in our society. I feel like that, I don't think it would be interesting to go back to those questions again for a sequel. So I haven't, I don't have any kind of, uh, right now, I don't, I'm not sure what the sequel would exactly be. And I kind of, when I finished it, it definitely felt finished to me, but I never say never. So it may happen. <laughs> Everything I ever write has a sequel. There are just the sequels I write and the sequels I never get to. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So um, um, something you you said that struck me as curious, what you had started this with a boy, uh, but then you decided that no. So how did you decide that Ku should be a girl, should be 10? Why is that the ideal person story? I feel like with, with Ku being a girl, it was more my own experience as a girl really led me to um, be more interested in that or feel more confident about my abilities to write that character as a girl just because of my own experience. I would like to write um, a boy character in the future, but Ku just seemed intuitively it should be a girl. So I changed that after a day or two. I also feel like a lot of adventure books, now it's significantly changed, but when I was a child, a lot of the books where kids went on adventures or showed a lot of bravery were usually boy characters and it was less common back when I was reading for the focus to be on a girl now that's changed a lot but it definitely made me feel like I wanted to show her as uh her as going on this kind of adventure what it was like as a girl I also like I picked the age 10 because um I felt like 10 is is an age when a lot of kids begin to understand themselves as individuals and start to explore their own agency and their ability to choose a different way of thinking or being than their family. Um, And I remember that was the age when I first felt a lot of loneliness when I was at school and the sense that um, I didn't really have a friend group when I was about 10 to 11 to 12 and I didn't really have close friends who were at school and it was a real period where I, I had to navigate that. And I feel like Koo also starts to feel really different from um, the flock and her life on the roof. She starts to wonder what else is out there. And um, 
then she has to go explore it. Um, and at the same time, I also feel like 10, when I was 10 and 11, I had a less uh, cynical view of the world than I got when I was a little older. And it was easier to feel an uncomplicated loyalty uh, and a lot of passion to fix things and make them right. A sense, I had a very clear sense of justice when I was that age. And um, I think a lot of other kids have it too. And then you get a little older, 12, 13, things start to be more complicated. And you are, start to understand more of the nuance to situations. And I think I really wanted that sense that Q, Q has this kind of very direct sense of what's right as she goes through the world and um, a clarity. And I wanted to be able to explore that. I think that might be one of the reasons that I'm uh, uh, circling back to write middle grade again and again is because my my, my years as 10 and 11 were, were relatively pretty fantastic. Uh, I knew everything about the world. I've never been so confident in my views as yeah. when I was 11. Let me sit down and I'll tell you how the world works and it's right. all just and good. And don't worry about it. Uh, and then it was in adolescence when I had a couple of friends move away. I found myself a little bit lonely at school. Uh, so we did a unit on the Holocaust. And I said, wait a minute, that's that's also possible? <laughs> Hold on. This challenges what I what I thought about the world. Uh, and, and, and so that's why I, I tend to stay away from the older ages. And I, I like to remember, oh, yeah, 10, 11, you had it all figured out. Go back and, and, and get that surety. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, Another question I had for you, because there's there's a lot of wonderful world building uh, that, that takes place. Uh, let's start with uh, pigeons. How much research did you do about pigeons? How important was it to you to portray pigeons as actual pigeons while still being uh, true to the somewhat fantastical nature of, of parts of the story? Well, that was a really kind of difficult line to figure out. Um, also, because pigeon research... Uh, advanced by, I'm trying to think of a pun of leaps and bounds, by many wing, anyway, there's a lot that's come out about pigeon brains and pigeon intelligence just in the past five years that wasn't known or easily accessible when I first started writing the book. Um, and I... What are you doing, like, pigeon researchers? That's that cool. <laughs> well, pigeon researchers, I feel like there's just come, a lot more has come out, um, or a lot more... Uh, well-designed studies have been done in the past few years. Um, and uh, I definitely felt like I wanted the, some things I took liberty with, like their ability to carry things is definitely, I don't know that they could carry, a group of pigeons could carry a girl like they, um, like they did, but other aspects of it, I, um, are definitely real. Like the facts that Aggie, Koo's friend, mentions during the book, those are all based on actuality. And even Burr's ability to, the pigeon's ability to recognize um, Koo's name, that's real. Because uh, scientists have shown that pigeons can recognize typos in common words, uh, which is fascinating. If they, they see, after they've been trained to identify words, which they can, they can tell if a word like bird that they're familiar with, it should be B-I-R-D. They recognize if it's B-R-I-D that it's been spelled incorrectly, but that it's still bird. So mm -hmm. I find that really fascinating. Um, they, uh, they can also pass the mirror test, which some other animals can, which is that when they're looking in a mirror, they understand that they are looking at themselves, not at another pigeon. Um, not all birds pass that. So um, they also, uh, they do, though, remain, some of their secrets have not been figured out. There are a lot of um, hypotheses about how they navigate so perfectly, like with the pigeon homing instinct, where pigeons are able to almost always return to the exact place where they were born, even from hundreds or thousands of miles away, no matter the weather or any kind of obstacles that people or scientists try to put in their way, um, there's still not a clear explanation for how they do that. It seems to have something to do with the, that they actually are able to see the Earth's magnetic field in a way that humans can't, um, but it's not- So they're just kind of like flying around like Neo in the Matrix? 
kind of yeah <laughs> it, they are not it still hasn't been definitively uh nailed down exactly how they do it well that's what you'll explore in coup too <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> we'll see so did you, I, this is a question I ask a lot that I think is probably a little bit obnoxious, but I just know too many writers. Did you uh, go up on any roofs? Did you spend a lot of time around pigeons? So I did. I actually, I respect pigeons. I've fed them. I find, I do understand why some people are skittish around them because they can be really intense when you are, are giving them food and when they come at you, it's a really intense sensory experience. Um, in terms of roofs, I used to spend a lot of time at a uh, arts organization that I don't think is is in the same location anymore called Flux Factory that used to be in Sunnyside, Queens, next to the Sunnyside Rail Yard, which is where the uh, a lot of New York's trains are kept for maintenance and in between commuter hour. Um, and their building was in this old warehouse, the factory building that was directly next to the rail yard. And Ku's setting is definitely based on that. I don't even think the building exists anymore. I think it's been torn down because we, my husband and I drove around it recently. And I also looked on Google Maps and it appears to be either being reconstructed. Anyway, it's not there. But I, uh, a lot of the descriptions of Ku's view came from my experience of spending time on that roof. It was accessible from the arts organization, was kind of in this top floor section that was took up half of the roof of the floor below. So they could walk out with a door onto the roof. And yeah, so that, and I spent a lot of time there when I was a teenager which was around the same time that I got the idea for Coup. So the two kind of uh, blended together. It's Coup's setting is sort of based on Jersey City in a place that doesn't exist anymore there because it's all been torn down and turn in, turned into housing and also sort of about this uh, place in Queens that's also been changed. Well, now a version of it will live on forever, immortalized yeah. in Coup, right? Exactly. <laughs> so how did you decide on pigeon dialect? That was, I kind of went back and forth a bunch and on different possible ways of uh, depicting the dialogue. And I also, at um, one point, I had the pigeon speaking normally in one draft. This was before it went out on submission to editors. And a couple of different people read it and said, no, who had read earlier <laughs> drafts and said, bring back the pigeon talk. And so I did that. And um, I think it's the first time the copy editors at Harper, I imagine, have dealt with the pretend pigeon dialect. And we had to sort of, there were some questions during the proofreading and copy editing process. It was like, are we sure that the pigeons consistently use this construction? <laughs> <laughs> for different things, so. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's kind of fun because at its core, it, it is a fantasy story, but with a lot of realistic elements and without yeah. without doing that thing I do where I spoil an author's book, there are some serious issues that are explored. Uh, yeah. within, not too serious. It's it's a fun book. You're going to have a great time as Steve does, but there is some real meat on this bone. Um, and is it, did you feel that when you had the birds kind of sitting down like Disney characters and you know, gargoyles talking to Quasimodo, um, that, um, that uh, if they were to burst out in spontaneous song, that would kind of take away from the realism you needed for yeah. the marital issues? I also never was into that kind of, um, book when I was a kid. I liked humor, but, um, I don't, maybe I should, should have I was never a Disney fan as a child. I always found the kind Happy of... Happy readership gone. What are you doing? I, yeah. I, I mean, I'm honest. I don't. I have utmost respect for people who are and did. But for me, when I was a kid, I really... Um, I liked more serious books. And I don't think who is that... I mean, I don't know how serious one... Like you said, there's some issues. It's not... I don't think it's heavy-handed. Um, but I definitely wanted... I didn't want the birds to be comical in and of themselves even though i think ruhu one of the birds he's kind of vicious but he's also really funny um and i was happy when that he kind of takes the comedic 
uh, he's like the comical figure, even though he's also a little, I mean, he's, he's not very nice. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit more about Ruhu, but first, uh, something I wanted to praise you for, because I was so excited, oh. and it's early in the book, so I know I'm not spoiling, um, is um, in a story in which pigeons can fly a, a little girl, in which um, they do they do talk, um, although it's a very specific pigeon dialect that's it's not cartoonish. Um, you uh, explained to us that there are, are bags on the roof that they're using and that some of them Ku uses specifically to go to the bathroom. And when I read that, I was just like pumping my fist yes. because too many books leave out that, that detail. That's the first question I have is, well, if you're on a roof all the time, what uh, sooner or later? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because that's definitely come up. It came up, it was in the draft, it was out of the draft. There was some question back and forth on whether it should be in the draft. And then um, uh, it definitely stayed. There was no fight or anything. It was just a lot of like, oh, should this be? Do we need to address this? Yes, we should address this. And different readers had different ideas. Um, I know there are even now people who have read it that I don't know who uh, are happy about that fact. And then other people who were like, ah, why would that need to be mentioned? So, but I'm glad it's there. And I was definitely like, as a child, I definitely cared about those kind of realistic touches in books. It bothered me when uh, there was like in a fantasy book when the fact that they needed to eat was never addressed, how they were getting the food. <laughs> like that was always something that bothered me as a child. Like, why aren't they hungry on this five day trek to go slay a dragon where you no, know, they've never discussed where they're getting their bread from. It just falls from the sky, I suppose. Yeah, I so. <laughs> well, what I like about it, um, now one, I'm I'm just bent that way, and I, I like details like that. Uh, but two, uh, is it helps to kind of counterbalance some of the unrealistic things because I I'll, so. I'll start to to think that oh well, this is you know pigeons are talking, but then you get that like oh well, that's that's definitely real. So that yeah. <laughs> that's weight and, uh, and and carries over to the more fantastical elements to make the whole thing seem a little bit more real. Yeah, I hope so. I'm glad that it achieved that. I was definitely that was what it was going for. Well, we'll have to see. It sounds like the middle grade readers, uh, the tribunal was thrilled. Um, I That's enjoyed it very much. So I imagine that there there will probably be a couple of people on Goodreads. There always are. What are you people doing? Come on, find something better to do with your time. One stars on Goodreads. Right. But the vast majority of people, I think, are going to be in my camp. <laughs> we'll I hope so. Um, a couple more questions about our coup, but I'm watching our time. and It's just flying by. Oh. Um, uh, it always goes so much faster than, than when I plan it in my head. Um, another question I really wanted to ask you about Ku, and then we'll, we'll circle back to maybe libraries and, and start to think about Colin today. Um, but there are, uh, I think, three different uh, major adult characters in the story without getting into spoiler territory. Uh, and each of them has sort of a mini arc. Uh, and each of them is fairly well defined, uh, particularly Tully, you mentioned uh, I know I can talk about Tully. Uh, you, you, you said her name. I won't mention the others. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what's the what what advice do you have about when you're writing a middle grade story about keeping your focus on our ten year old protagonist because that's who the reader's going to gravitate toward, while fully fleshing out those adults and not cheating them? Well, I guess I'm a huge fan of um, uh, Cheryl Klein, who wrote this book. I can't remember the actual title of the book. I should have written it down. She wrote a guide to writing um, middle grade. With It was really, actually, I think it's a collection of um, speeches that she gave at various conferences and some essays. But it includes a lot of ideas for keeping track of your minor characters in terms of writing out... Um, different. She has different uh, checklists for writing out their backgrounds so that you understand what their wants and desires are and you understand their identities and how their um, their interior values and their character traits fuel their reactions and actions in your manuscript. And I found that um, using her framework to fully flesh out outside of the manuscript, separately on a piece of paper, these characters really helped me be able to draw on that for the scenes that the they these minor characters appeared in so that their reactions were clear in terms of the reader understanding where they were coming from for each of their their roles. So Cheryl Klein was really helpful. I, in terms of keeping the focus on the child character, 
Baku is in every single scene in the book. So that definitely helped. And she is um, fully active in her own stories. Like the choices that she she makes, she's not being swept along by the choices of these adults. Uh, primarily, she is instigating a lot of the action on her own and the adults are reacting. And there, there are other points where that's not the case, but in general, Ku is a very active protagonist. We're never, we're never completely away from Ku. We're, we're going to find our way back to her. Yeah. Um. So, so many questions. I, I'm, I'm just going to chuck. Uh, you mentioned Cheryl Carter. Are there any other uh, reading guides or writing guides that you found helpful in learning how to write that you maybe would recommend to authors listening? Well, Cheryl Klein, uh, someday if Zadie Smith writes a guide to writing, I suggest everyone on the planet who wants to write a book buy it because she was amazing. And I was, I don't think I would be at the skill level I am if I had not taken her class where we didn't actually do any fiction writing. She had us read books and then we had to write um, critical essays about the books. But her, the essay structures and the prompts that she gave us were extremely focused and she was very rigorous in going through um, why certain literature works and why others don't. And so I feel like I learned a lot from her about the wider um, themes of books or why books become memorable and strike a chord. So that experience, which unfortunately is not in book form, was also really formative for me. And uh, you mentioned um, the uh, the pigeon research becoming available after you'd finished Coup. And well, maybe, no, it's like uh, as the, in the process of it. Like a oh, lot of it came out in the past five years. So oh, there was okay. so more you were able to make some corrections and, and yeah. date. So this is this is cutting edge. Pigeon research included in coup, folks. You're, you're not going to get yesterday's pigeons. Yeah. <laughs> These are modern pigeons. Yes. Uh, no, check out, you mentioned Cheryl Klein. Uh, Cheryl Klein. Cheryl Klein, who I had mentioned in the Book of David, and it just made me remember that I was so terrified as I was trying to finish the Book of David that UFO disclosure would happen before I finished it, and oh, then it, all yeah. my fictions would be blown up. Yes. <laughs> and all of that is a as a ham handed segue to Kayla Knoll. Do you believe in flying saucers and have you seen one? All right. Yes. I have not seen one. I absolutely definitely believe in them because I know other people that I'm close to and that I really uh that I really uh trust and know well who feel that they have had encounters with paranormal um, situations. So I, I absolutely believe that there's unexplained phenomena in the world. Um, whether it is what would be conventionally, uh, described as aliens, I don't know. And there might be other explanations or, um, maybe aliens are not what we commonly, maybe aliens are something different than what pop culture has them described as in this moment. I feel like they could be beyond our understanding. Um, I am a big fan of science, but I also definitely believe that there's a lot that science has yet to be able to determine or even know how to investigate. And in terms of perspective, I think all we have to do is think about how limited science was 100 years ago and think about how limited it may seem 100 years from now. Um, And I absolutely think that there's paranormal things out there. 100% agree. Uh, That's one of the reasons I continue to ask this question in two episodes. I think from now, I can't can't remember, two or three episodes. Keep listening to this team, audience. you get there. Uh, I chatted with uh, Avi. Uh, and uh, the oh, first question is, why do you ask people that? And I said, well, one reason I ask that is it's, it's a vaguely political because I want more people to be aware of just how much information is out there about flying saucers. Yeah. Because one thing that's going to help science move forward is if you take your fingers out of your ear and stop going, la, 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 that can't be real. It is, though. <laughs> Let's take a look. <laughs> I mean, I was fascinated by the articles that came out in The New York Times over the past. I'm sure other publications also wrote about them and I'm not sure if who broke the story but 
uh, you're probably aware of it, the extensive sightings of unexplained high-speed objects by uh, Air Force pilots and Navy pilots over the past few years. Yes, I can't um, think of the woman's name, but she's a very well-respected journalist, and it's an excellent novel. And it's it's absolutely, I mean, it's the Army disclosing that they, the military of the United States disclosing that they were, I don't know if it was disclosed or if it was leaked, but basically they can't explain what this stuff is. And I think that that speaks to, um, that speaks to the, the possibilities and our own limitations. And I'm also, I think that every, I'm not an atheist. I think that there's a lot in the world that is, um, not ex not explained by rational what right now is considered the limits of the rational yeah it's kind of like us like you said going back i don't know 200 years ago and like all right well our science has covered everything yes exactly <laughs> but there's there's a real sense of, of hubris i think in our culture that does assume that because we have high-speed computers and really advanced medical procedures now that everything has been explained and I unfortunately I think it speaks to a kind of um, impoverishment of possibility and a uh, uh, and questions and I think that it's a dangerous way of thinking because it ultimately limits the questions that are asked which limits the answers that we may get 100% agree. Kayla no, I'm glad to have you in this fight. I'm glad Keep to the be pressure here. on, folks. Call yes. your senators. <laughs> yes. Let's get the information out. Uh, I'm watching our time. I know we're just about there. Would I be terribly imposing with two more questions? Sure, that's great. No problem. Okay, because the joke's on you. The first one's a long one. <laughs> okay. uh, I wanted to go back to um, your experience as not being a fast reader. Uh, early on, you said it took you to about second grade to, to figure out reading and, and feel okay. confident. And I talked, like I say, with, with Avi, uh, mark your calendars, esteemed audience is coming. Um, and he, of course, uh, famously uh, has dysgraphia and has talked often about that and how that's impacted him as a reader into a writer. Um, and that, that that maybe fueled his desire to become a better reader. And I was reading about uh, you uh, and about how I think you were taking ginger candies to, to really concentrate and continue reading. Yes. Which I've I never heard before. What, is that, what does that do? Well, it was actually because we, um, at certain points in my childhood, we moved all the time. Usually within the same school district, but we were just, I moved a lot as a kid. We were always in rentals that were kind of falling apart and bad and um, my mom really tried, but it was, it was hard. And I remember there were different points in my childhood when we spent a lot of time driving different places because um, we were living in the middle of nowhere in western New Jersey at one point. It was like 20 minutes to go get groceries or 30 minutes to go to the grocery store. So um, I would, that was like my precious reading time because I had schoolwork. And so, but I got motion sickness when I was in the car. And I discovered that if I had a ginger candy, because ginger is like an anti-nausea, um, it, it, it can reduce nausea. I discovered that when I would eat ginger candies, my motion sickness would go away. So I would eat, I, my mom would happily, she would get me these ginger candies at the health food store. We always went to the health food store. And um, I was like that kind of family, like one of the health food, we didn't have money, like we were very, financially insecure when I was a child, but we always were going to the health food store. And um, I would have one of my health food store ginger candies, and I would be able to read for the 20 minute trip to the grocery store and back. Or also, I remember sometimes we lived in rentals that didn't have laundry. And we were actually in the middle, like seriously, in the middle of nowhere as far as that can be in New Jersey. And there was no laundromat in our town. So every week we had to travel like 30 minutes each way to go to a laundromat in several towns over. So I would have my stack of library books and my ginger candies in the car. I remember I would have, sometimes it was too dark to read in the car. So uh, I would have to wait until we were on, I would be like holding my book up to try to get the, the lights from outside to fall on the page. I was reading. Yeah. 
And you are an uh, outspoken uh, supporter of libraries. Yes. I love this, a dedicated reader. So if you would talk a little bit about uh, libraries and the difference they made for you in reading, and then, and then I'll ask you my final question. Sure. I mean, I would not, I don't know if I would have a book published or be a reader or a writer the way that I am if I hadn't had access to my school libraries and to the public library, um, because we didn't have any extra disposable income to buy books when I was a child. And I was... When I was older, my mother actually got a better job. And by the time I was a teenager, she was making a decent wage. But she was a single mom. My dad, he moved back to Europe and didn't support us when I was a child. Um, so there's like a lot of, and he's, and then he passed away. So it's like, I, we just didn't have a lot of financial security. And um, my mom would take me to the library it, usually twice a week. And that was my main access point for reading and I would read so much that I would go through just stacks of books and the librarians were always really helpful and understanding and my school library was like a kind of it had a much smaller circulation than the public library I remember feeling um of course it wasn't the librarian's fault but I remember feeling frustrated that there really wasn't a lot to choose from um but it was a place that I could go to read and I would often sneak there when I was supposed to be doing uh, other things. Like I was a little, I would not go to gym class and I would go to the library instead in middle school and no one stopped me. So <laughs> I, I, when I look back on it now, I don't understand. Like, I think I did. I think I went to gym class, which was a class that showed up on your report card. I think in seventh grade, I went, fewer than a half dozen times and when everyone else went to gym I would just leave the line and go to the library and no one said anything well they were training an athlete they were training a writer uh, yeah I guess so it was just like, <laughs> I was extremely obedient as a child I never broke rules and I think that one was just I tried it once or twice no one said anything and I just kept going <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I think maybe one of the best and worst things that ever happened to me, we weren't, uh, we weren't wealthy. Um, although we were, you know, this was the eighties. So the middle class still meant something. Yeah. Uh, we're middle class enough that, uh, I had a game boy and sometimes I think that's the worst thing that ever happened to me and the best, the best, because, Oh my God, do I love Mario? But also I think about how many books I could have also read, uh, if I had put, True. if I had had that distraction there. I guess so. I also, I was, I've never been good at video games. I remember my cousins had them and I was, if you, if you had to choose someone to play against, like, hello, everyone picked me first because <laughs> I just was, I don't have particularly great hand-eye coordination. And so I think that for me, video games were always really, um, when I was around them, they were really frustrating because I wasn't, I didn't have innate talent. Oh, they run your life. You're better off. <laughs> My husband plays them a lot. He really likes the games that, are, that have a narrative arc. So they're around. Like he plays um, Final Fantasy and some other ones. Zelda. No, oh, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. I, I've also gone on record as saying that if I find out at the end of my life that I could have written one or two or three more novels if I hadn't played Red Dead Redemption 2 or Breath of the Wild, fair yeah. trade. Yeah, <laughs> I think his, his idea is he just loves them so much that they're yeah and I, I i have an appreciation for them through him okay well i'm talking your face off you you will have to come back when kutu comes out or when the next book comes out and we'll have yeah. to chat some more uh my final question for you that. Today is uh some variation of, uh, I always ask some version of this because it, it's an opportunity for you to answer the question I wasn't smart enough to, to have asked uh, during our talk. Uh, and that is, if there was one or two bits of wisdom you could go back and give uh, yourself when you were first starting on your writer's journey or maybe somewhere along the way that would have made a huge difference, maybe saved you some time, uh, what would you go back and tell yourself? I would say to read, 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 read. And I did that. Um, but I feel like when I look back, I've been keeping lists of books that I read um, for years now, like try to not on Goodreads or anything, just in my own notes. I, um, I write down every book I read and the date I read it. And when I look back, I think that 
if I had read even more middle grade books the way that I do now instead of just um, I always read them but I didn't make it part of my job I think I would have probably understood edits that I needed to make structurally to coup or themes that I needed to focus on better um, so my suggestion would be to read obsessively even more than you currently do so um, right now I set goals for myself and I try to be I try to be every other book I read I try to make a recently published middle grade book and then in between I read adult nonfiction and um, uh, older books and older middle grade books but every other book I try to make current which helps me understand the rest of the field and um, when I'm reading really intensively, I find that I'm a faster writer and a better writer. And it helps me, um, it helps inspire me, especially structurally, because I feel like what I struggle with the most is pacing and plot. And so when I'm reading a lot of other books, other middle grade books, it's kind of planting structurally in my mind. It's conditioning me to understand and recognize patterns in um, plots and pacing that then I can just draw from because I'm familiar with so many different uh, manifestations of plot and pacing. I'm going to play this for every workshop I ever lead. Okay. What, uh, <laughs> what, what's, what's, uh, now that you're a professional author, this is not, this is a follow-up question. Not, I'm not, I'm not sneaking into one, no, uh, but worry. what does your reading schedule look like now, uh, Kayla Knoll, professional author? Well, I read every night, um, and I try to read, sometimes I fall asleep the same time my daughter does, <laughs> because she gets up at, uh, right now, I, she gets up around five most mornings, and I get up with her, so um, sometimes I don't read at night, because I just desperately need to catch up on sleep, and I'll go to bed at eight, um, but I usually read every night, and I have uh, my husband and I, we trade off when he's teaching. I um, take care of Alice and when he's, um, he's a college teacher, so he doesn't teach every day. And then when I am, um, anyway, we trade off. So when I have my chunks of time to write, I try to start by reading. So I will, instead of diving right into writing, unless I know exactly what I'm doing and I'm trying to finish something that's, that's, was very clearly flowing previously like a scene or a certain edit I will read for like 30 minutes to 45 minutes to prime my brain for um what edited final prose sounds like and that really helps yeah I also try to finish every book that I read it's and it's even and that's because I've never not that there is ever a terrible yeah if you found one there have just been some books that I thought, oh, I can't stand this, like 30 pages in and then 50 pages in. I love it. So I've learned that having to finish a book that I really dislike a few times saves me from so many other books that I might have put down and not finished at a point when I didn't like them that I ended up loving. So and I also feel like even books that I don't like teach me a lot because I can figure out, okay, why don't I like this? Or why is this not working for me? And it could work for someone else, but why personally does this feel like it, my interest is waning here? And that makes it easier for me to identify those own places in my book and um, my writing. And again, for me, I feel like at this point in my life, pacing is my big issue, pacing and plotting. And um, so even reading a book that isn't working for me helps me understand why why it's not working so the best lessons you'll ever get are found in bad books yeah. kayla come back i could talk to you for another three oh, hours and sometime i will <laughs> i will that. you my next my next book whenever that comes out so i mean i have it's i have a second book that's supposed to come out i'm not sure i don't have a pub date for it yet but i'm working on it as soon as you find out, let me know, and we will set up plans to make that happen. Yeah. Thank uh, you so for, much for uh, on here. You're like, you, I think when people decide to go, uh, when someone, historian 50 years from now, wants to write about children's literature as it was now, your blog and your podcast are going to be a huge resource for that person. 
So you're doing a very important thing. Thank you. I'm going to walk around the rest of the day with a big head. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I would be thrilled to be a footnote in a book about children's literature uh, many years from now. But thank you very much for the sentiment. Yeah, I appreciate sure. it. Thank you for having me on. I'm really honored. Where uh, where can esteemed audience find you online? Uh, learn more about you, follow you on Twitter, all that good stuff. I am at kaylanoel.com, K-A-E-L-A-N-O-E-L.com. And my Twitter handle is underscore Kayla Noel underscore. Um, and my book is available on IndieBound, at your local bookstores, at um, on all the other websites where you can buy books. And uh, yeah, it's also, it's an Indie Next Spring 2020 pick. Um, so and for their top 10 list. So most independent bookstores, probably if you go in, it will be right there. So if not, you can ask your bookseller for it and they will, they will get it for you. Uh, any other social media where uh, folks can find you? I, I'm also on, I'm on Instagram. If you search me by my name, you can find me there. And that's about it. That's funny. Find, <laughs> yeah, social media, it's a whole other, whole other thing. But. Although sooner or later, a bunch of the folks I'm going to talk to are all going to start podcasts and I'm going to go on them all. I can't wait. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I know. Well, as always, esteemed audience, you can find me at middlegradeninja.com. Don't forget to pre-order your copy of Banneker Bones and the Cyborg Conspiracy. Uh, if you head to middlegradeninja.com, you can figure out when the heck uh, Avi's episode is going to air, but it's coming up. Look forward to that, uh, as well as a list of all the other wonderful uh, guests that we're going to have plus just an archive, an absolute treasure trove, if you will, of uh, interviews with uh, lots of folks I find interesting. I know you will as well. Uh, Kayla, I always ask our guests to sign us off with the very official, very professional podcast sounding sign-off phrase, hi-ya and what have you. Will you sign us off? Sure. Hi-ya and what have you. <laughs>